My name is Jean Quick de C. Smith, and I was born on the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Reservation in western Montana near the Canadian border. So it's a long ways from where you are, and I'm living in New Mexico right now. But at that time in 1940 was right after the Depression in America and you know during the Second World War. And life was very difficult for people of color, especially for Native Americans, because we were stranded sort of on our reservations, not being able to, my tribe, hunt buffalo and do food harvesting that we had traditionally done. I can remember there that my sister and I were hungry all the time, always cold, always sick. As the war started to wane, my mother wasn't there. My father kept us part of the time. And then sometimes if he was too drunk, the welfare would come and take us away for a while. And then my father would come back and get us, uh, my sister and me. And so I remember we moved off of that reservation and we lived way, way in um, a place called Black Diamond. And that's where I started school. And I remember when I started school there that that was the first time I had seen crayons or tempera paint or library paste. And little Indian kids always like smell stuff and then they eat it or taste it. So, uh, you know, I did that. I can tell you that the the crayons don't, they didn't chew up. They smelled really good, but they didn't chew up very well and made crumbles in my mouth. The library paste was actually very delicious. And uh, that was always good for a snack. The tempera paint was just kind of gritty, but oh my gosh, when I was able to paint, I could see this was the sweet spot. This was the place to be. And I didn't know the word for artist, but I could tell you that that began my journey as an artist. And when the bookmobile came down the road to our farm, I would take all the books I could get out of there and I would have to hide to read books because my uh, stepmother would make me chop wood or do something, clean the barn. And so I would read as many books as I could get. And the books took me like out of my world and to other worlds. And that was the most exciting thing in my life, I think, at that point was to, the minute I wasn't working, to be able to read a book. And then when I said I wanted to go to college, everybody said, oh, oh, you have to get a job. You can't go to college. But I did. I went to college. I worked for a veterinarian, worked in the library, and went for two years to a junior college, and then moved to Seattle and went to the University of Washington. And then I moved to Texas and went to school. I moved to Massachusetts and went to school. It took me 20 years, actually, because of poverty, because of raising my children, to just get a BA degree. We have the highest rate of diabetes in the country. We have the highest rate of suicide. We have the highest jobless uh, on our reservations. It's almost 75%. It's horrific. But because we take care of each other, because we are tribal people, you know, when someone's hungry, we try to do something about it. But all in all, I have to say, things are better than when I was a child. I mean, when I was a child, I thought we were not going to live. That's how bad things were. I really thought we were going to die. And I thought I would be dead in my late teens. So we still have a lot of work to do. But I see our road as education. That is everything to me. There is no history written in our public schools about the genocide that went on in this country, about what the Europeans did to Native Americans and what they are still doing to Native Americans. So that's something that's on my agenda all the time. Long ago, I started picking up on often white males in New York, so you know, you've know you seen Jasper Johns and Rauschenberg and sometimes Gustin, different ones that I sort of looked at. And then I would flip it. Indian humor is always turned upside down and turned backwards and turned around. That's really ethnic humor, is that you take what people know and when you turn it upside down or you turn it around, the Cherokees call it a turning around, but I see it that way and that's what makes Indian humor. So there's some of that in my work as well. So right now in this room, I have maps around 
uh, all around the walls here, maps that I'm working on. I don't know if I can do this. Got maps over here, all around the walls. There's maps. It's because I'm talking right now about the land. Here's Turtle Island. This map says she, her, hers. It's Mother Earth. La Pachamama. She, her, hers. And you know how the gender thing is going right now? So I use that gender thing. And then over here, and I'm making, these are coyote heads because coyote, okay, can you see down there? It goes all the way down there. Okay, these are all US maps. And it's about the land. So here now I can talk about the land, but also social justice. Because, because like yesterday, Trump announced that he's going to drill in the Tongass. You know, 25 years ago, I made a big canoe, like 18 feet long, painted it about the Tongass rainforest and about what you get for grizzlies and eagles and caribou is you get these little plastic baskets that I hung above it. So I've been making these trade canoes too, where we trade the plastic baskets for the wildlife. When you say, in the darkness, we sing. In the darkness, we have to be coyote, which is at home what they say is practice your sneak up. And coyote is part of my creation story. Coyote helped the matkin turn the lights on, meaning bring, bring the sun and, and create the people. And in my garden out here, I used to have wild bees, lots of wild bees. I had lots of butterflies in my garden, no more. And not only that, 30% of the birds here in my village have disappeared. So I, as a gardener, I'm outside and I can see the sun and I can follow the weather and I can see for myself. Nobody has to tell me that something is happening terrible about our planet. You know, when you make a message that might or could maybe teach people something. Like I made a canoe about using Native Americans for mascots and commodity, commodification of Americans. You know, it had lots of collage in it about Native Americans. And a board member at the Chrysler Museum in Norfolk said to me, you know, I really like your painting, but I don't like your politics at all. And I thought that was a real compliment coming from this rich white guy. So I'm saying, if I can put that in front of his face, and even though he doesn't like it, that gives me a certain amount of power. They might not agree with what I'm saying, but I get my message there. And it's there you know, every day, all day, if it's hanging or if it's traveling. So yeah, that's a, there, there's a certain amount of power uh, by being able to do that. And I feel very privileged about being able to do that because I'm taking information that they might never see, that I might learn on the reservation, and I'm putting it someplace where it would never likely be if I'm so lucky, if I'm so blessed. The ground that I walk on here and, you know, all through the Rocky Mountains is the land of my ancestors. Their dust is all over the place here. I know when I'm out there, what I call the sacred, you'll see it sometimes in my work, the sacred is not, I say this to audiences, it's not in this room, it's not inside of a building, it's not something that you wear around your neck. The sacred is the whole environment out here. It's all of nature. That is the sacred. Everything there, the animals, the birds, the insects. So when we give a prayer at home, you hear the elders stand up. They're talking to the ripples in the stream. They're talking to the pebbles, the rocks. They're talking to the wind through the trees. You know, they try to like commemorate everything in a prayer because that is the sacred. It's the life force that runs through all these things. It's the life force that goes through us while we're here and then we become part of everything again.